Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a chemical and environmental engineer by training. During the last 35 years or so in my profession, my research has revolved around water. Water, which is often referred to as life, but at the same time, it can also be the cause of death. <coughs> this is a gentleman who doesn't need any introduction. He's known to everybody. At the same time, when you look at this woman or lady, hardly anybody knows her. These two people literally live in two different worlds. And to make it even worse, this woman makes less than $2 a day. But still, these two people have one amazing similarity. That is, in regard to drinking water, both of them drink approximately two liters of safe drinking water every day. 69% of their body weight is due to water. And at the same time, the water they drink, that basically is very much in compliance with stipulations set by international organizations like World Health Organization. So that's a huge similarity for two people who are seemingly so different. What exactly is that woman doing and where is this particular place? This is in a remote village bordering India and Bangladesh. She is collecting her daily supply of drinking and cooking water from underground. Why underground? Because the water from lakes, ponds, or canals, which we call surface water, they are often contaminated with the germs of typhoid, cholera, dysentery, things like that. On the contrary, water from underground is naturally filtered, so it is kind of microorganism free, and that's why United Nations sank millions of this kind of tube wells around the world. This particular picture I took myself in February 1995. This is a little over 23 years ago. So during the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a condensed version of what unfolded during this period of 23 years. This is, again, almost the same, but this is in the middle of Bangladesh after a little bit of flood, and you can see water, water everywhere. But still, this lady is basically collecting water from underground through that well for the same reason. So it was very common. Then something happened, something which was not in the radar of United Nations, which was completely unforeseen. There was tiny amount of arsenic got contaminated with groundwater due to natural soil leaching. The key word is natural soil leaching. Arsenic is extremely toxic, but at the same time, it doesn't provide any color, odor, and taste. That's why historically, you know, when uh, human beings, we wanted to get rid of our enemies, kings, queens, or spouses, other people, arsenic was always the substance of choice. Here, though, it is not man-made. This is all natural or mother nature. And these are the pictures, not very gruesome ones, but taken uh, primarily by me around different countries in the world. Thousands of people died. And as a result of that, this is a huge natural calamity. So it appeared in the first page of New York Times. New York Times called it the greatest natural calamity of our time. The punch word is natural. It is not due to any Russian collusion, not because of any CIS covert activity. It's all mother -led nature all the way. When I was a graduate student myself, somebody came and gave a lecture about water. And the content has not changed. And the point he was making is about 29,000 people around the world die every day, every day because of waterborne diseases. And then, in order to make the story more sensational, what he said was that it is almost like 40 fully loaded 747s crashing every day. Just imagine, 40 fully loaded 747 crashing every day. And if that time comes, you'd probably think the world is coming to an end. But now, then I realize there's a huge disconnect, huge lie embedded in that, because the people who die, these 29,000 people, 
they have never been into 747. They even do not even know I mean, what the inside of 747 look like. They mostly look like this. This is in one of the villages where you work. This guy was obviously was suffering from arsenic-related cancer. And the list he is carrying, this is the list of 28 people in a small village of 200 families where these 28 people apparently have died of arsenic-related complication, primarily cancer. And the other thing is also true, all these people make also less than $2 a day. So this aeroplane, 747, and these people, there is a huge bar between the two. <clears throat> what happened after that? The government, NGOs, and other people wanted to do something. And the first thing they could do is they could identify, this is a well in Cambodia, and near the capital, Phnom Penh, they kind of marked it red, alerting people, do not drink water from here because this water contains a lot of arsenic in it. Quite naturally, they have to have, they have to drink water. They need two liters of water every day. They have to walk, they have to find another water resource. We are engineers, belong to an academic institution. Our ap approach was more like intervention. So the goal was, can we do something in the mouth of that well so that people can retain their old culture and still receive water they have drunk? So this is basically a follow-up of that. This is near Bangladesh border. This village girl, she's doing exactly the thing she was doing earlier. The only difference is now the water goes through this column and gets collected in real time, but in the process, it becomes arsenic safe. So basically, we started with that, did that in maybe 100 such villages. But this women or the people there didn't really need to know the underlying science or chemistry. So inside what was going on, very much like this. But again, the technology was brought down to a level where they could make use of it. This is a part of a research paper published in Environmental Science and Technology. And then we ran into another problem. The problem was, after three or six months, these filters get exhausted. So they need to be replenished. They need fresh supply of filters. And in a remote place, that's not easy. There came another research idea. Can we build a material, a filter material, which we can reuse, regenerate, and go on for years, so that once given to villagers or other people, they basically keep on using it for years, and then that started in 96. And then in 2003, this is the material we made. We call it hybrid and ion exchange nanosorbent. This is seven year period. You know, that's the tenacious journey. And we had our Eureka moment, and we made only two grams. And we obviously had a patent on the material. There was two grams after seven years of work. But between 2003 and 2018, maybe 200 million grams of materials have been commercially made. And at least 2 million people around the world in six different countries, including the United States, they get their safe drinking water through use of this material. The point here is, from our perspective, belonging to an academic institution, we start with science, Mr. Newton and then quite naturally proceed, and then go, keep trying, and eventually find out the lady, and then we want both of them to get married and live happily ever after. That is <coughs> the ultimate of science, because uh, empathy, compassion, uh, kindness, these are all good virtues, but they do not necessarily solve problem. So it's somehow you have to bring science and technology, get married to, all those good qualities in order to make a difference or in order to mitigate a kind of a mammoth crisis like this drinking water one. And then a lot of things happen quickly. This is in Bangladesh, you know, we install plants, people are collecting uh, safe drinking water in the morning twice a day. This is in Cambodia. And this is again near the same place. And if you watch a little carefully, this lady, she doesn't have the left hand which had to be amputated, that amputated because of arsenic-related complication or malignancy. And this plant essentially 
has removed for over three years arsenic from 600, we call it parts per billion, which is very high for arsenic, to less than five. Many students, NGOs, academic institutions from other countries, they have all been part of this collaborative exercise. This is Lee Blenny, uh, Lehigh graduates, a BS and MS degree holder. He's now a professor in his own right. But then something even more exciting happened. This is Michael German, who was a Lehigh graduate student, received his PhD last year, exciting character. He wanted to take all this thing through a social enterprise. He is standing there in the University of California, Berkeley, winning the first prize of $25,000. Another person also joined the team. This is Minha Choudhury. He also won several of such competitions. Minhaj, Mike, and myself, we have one commonality. We all were Fulbright Fellows in the Indian subcontinent. But the key spark happened when we won, which is called USIST Endowment Fund. USIST stands for United States, India, Science and Technology Endowment Fund. And they gave us two marching order. One is in many countries, including Africa and Asia, including China, there's also a fluoride problem. And fluoride in drinking water may not be as kind of toxic, but it leads to kind of which is called skeletal fluorosis. And you can very quickly see the bones basically, they basically decay with time. And it is a very common thing also in Kenya, Ethiopia, and other countries in Africa. That was one. And then there was another chart up there that was, can we transform? This is a crisis. Can we transform this crisis through technology into an economic opportunity, into providing employment to other people? Does technology do that? So what we got into was in a very kind of a, a concise form. So this is your contaminated well. We started making the material in India because that was the best location and it's uh, more democratic than other countries where the problem exists. And then we actually took the material, installed plants, and then there are places like Bangladesh and then in many schools, like this is a school where the children were kind of routinely drinking fluoride contaminated water. Now they drink safe water. And then obviously at the end, the key thing was there is a financial model there. That means the people, they may be poor. Maybe they are making less than $2 a day. They make a tiny amount of tariff or contribution. But that kind of allow to sustain the process for a very long time. And there are plenty of examples. So this is a guy who makes his entire living by transporting arsenic or fluoride safe water to remote villages. That's his sole source of income, which is very significant. This is the place where you can see this is an operator here who gets paid through the tariffs. And this is the one who basically is responsible for transporting the safe water. So this is like a employment circle being created. This is an example of how in one location between 2005 and 2017, how the revenue increased from kind of little over $500 to over $3,000 because more people uh, participated and the number basically grew from uh, about 250 to 500, so which means 500 families means like 2,000 people, they were participating over there. So that is <coughs> the kind of story, but from my end, that is always a take home message. You know, uh, I'm a professor, PhD, I do research, but we keep learning. So one key learning kind of message was, yes, we need science and engineering to solve problems, but rarely do it happens in a linear way. This is almost impossible, you know. Whatever we think, it's never going to happen. Murphy's law is the best law probably for that. So what do we do? We keep trying, keep trying, and then basically what happens is we arrive there, but in a very, very convoluted path. But that doesn't mean all the time went to west. 
in the process, obviously we have to have what you call a sense of humility, learning from people who are at the bottom of the pyramid, being kind of open and at the same time tenacity that my path may not be the right path, but then I have to find out the other one. So it is like a triangle with three posts. One is my technology, which is coming from Mr. Newton. I need humility to work with others because this problem involves people who are basically at the bottom of the pyramid. And obviously, there has to be some kind of a resolute pursuit for solving the problem. And only then we can go there and find our so ultimate of humanity and we can get the merit. And that's my 15 minute saga for the 23 year old story, you know, which unfolded at Lehigh. Thank you.